In the beginning of each of our lives, from the moment we're born, first we're spanked, we cry, and then we're given to our mother's arms. We're laid across her chest, and we're given a breast to suck from, to eat from, to breathe life from. This breast, it brings us milk, brings us food, sense of safety, trust, warmth, the heartbeat of our mother, skin to skin, comfort, trust and safety in the world, being engulfed and wrapped around in comfort. When we remember that all the neurons that fire together wire together, from the moment we are born, sense of safety, comfort, and trust are associated with food, and food that has a sweetness to it. Is it any wonder that most of us find comfort when we're lonely, sad, anxious, depressed, in food, in foods that have a lot of sugar content, high starch content, alcohol, which is pure sugar, it's the very first thing we turn to. And for many who don't do that, they starve themselves. They completely starve themselves from the nourishment and comfort that food can bring. This might be, I believe, the number one reason why, we, even though we know that sugar, starch, and overeating, junk food, all of those things are bad for us, that we can't stop, that we unconsciously always reach for that very thing that's going to bring us comfort. Well, today we're going to look at that in a whole new way. We're going to understand why and hopefully walk away with new tips as to how we can have better health, understand what we need, comfort ourselves, soothe ourselves, and yet do this in a healthier, more conscious, more awake way. Hi, I'm Dr. Goodall, and welcome to Are You Awake? How's everybody doing today? I hope everyone's doing well. I'm doing amazing. You know, I just got back from India, a two-week spiritual pilgrimage on you know, my own personal journey. You may have discovered by now that I can't do the work that I do without doing my own work. I can't ask anybody to look inside if I'm not willing to look myself. And while I was there, I had the opportunity to talk to many people that were also on the pilgrimage, look around the world, you know, see starvation, see hunger, see poverty, and look again at this whole concept of food and obesity in the United States and many Western civilizations, not just here, all around the world, and how food becomes the number one thing. You know, my grandmother, they used to call her Lady Heaven. Many people with ethnic backgrounds, you know, Italian, Greek, Latin American, actually doesn't matter, all ethnic backgrounds. If we think back, food is the very thing in which how we were shown love, you know, the holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Hanukkah, all the different holidays are always around food. There is some kind of incredible joy that food can bring, that breaking of bread, sitting across the table from people we love, sharing a meal. These experiences bring great memories. They also bring us comfort, soothing, joy, relationship, bonding. It's a way to bond, but that makes sense, doesn't it, given what we just talked about? Bonding through food is the very first experience we have. I mean, I can't imagine how scary that is to be an infant, to be swimming around in the womb for nine months, and all of a sudden everything's different. But the very first thing that quiets a baby is the mother's breast and the mother's chest. And yet we yearn for that our entire lives, don't we? That sense of connection, touch, the joy of falling in love. Ever notice how when people are newly in love, how they talk to each other, how they touch each other? It used to be a study that I would do. I'd you know sit in airplanes, airports, wherever, and just watch either young or old. It doesn't matter how old someone is, but two people that are newly in love usually are cooing and speaking baby talk to each other and petting each other and like little monkeys, you know, cleaning each other off, playing with the hair, playing with the cheek, always touching. It's the same sort of thing. It's what food brings is that instant soothing, that instant joy, an increase of oxytocin, which is the bonding chemical, which lowers our anxiety, heightens our sense of connection, heightens our sense of confidence in self. Food does this for us when we're conscious that we're using it for comfort. For many, it becomes this automatic subconscious process. And obesity and cancer and heart disease and sluggishness and depression it takes us to the other side when we overeat in an unconscious way or when we starve ourselves, when we hold ourselves back from any kind of nourishment. These things are metaphorical as well as physical. And I believe that the reason that people don't make change is because we don't understand the bigger dynamic. We don't understand the body, mind, soul process. 
health psychologists for decades have been looking at why is it that there's, you know, a plethora of information and data about health? You know, they were looking at smoking and, you know, food, obviously. And we know, like, we are inundated, Google, magazines, YouTube, podcasts, television. Nobody doesn't know anymore that gluten and too much starch and too much sugar is bad for us. We're going to talk a little bit more on the physical end of that in a moment. We all know that. And yet the knowing hasn't changed the behavior at all in decades of knowing and decades of more and more research. And it's befuddled health psychologists for many, many years. What is that? What is the reason for that? I have found in my practice that when we understand our body dynamic better, that we can make more conscious choices and it becomes easier and simpler to make choices that are better for us. People have asked me, you know, you're a naturopath and you've been doing these podcasts and you haven't spent a lot of time on the pure physical end. Well, I'm going to tell you why that is today. The reason I haven't is because of this piece I'm talking about today. We're inundated with the research and I can sit here week after week and I can give you cellular brain chemistry data on health. And and I love to do that. Don't get me wrong. And I do some and I will do continue to do more and more of that. But because knowing doesn't change our behavior. This podcast is about helping us wake up. And in that awakening and in that consciousness, self-responsibility occurs automatically. Those of you that have been listening to the podcast, check in, look at your life, and you can see that there are subtle changes and that things are just better. And doing the exercises at the end of the show have made a difference in your lives. I'm getting that kind of feedback. I know that to be true. Why is that? Because of the work you're doing, not what I'm doing. Because you're willing to look within. You're willing to awaken and have a higher consciousness. When we have that personal evolution, the choices we make automatically change. And even if the choices don't change, our understanding of our choice in the moment increases. And that alone can make all the difference. So let's talk about sugar. Let's bring this back to the beginning In the winter, when we're lonely, when we're depressed, when our relationship isn't going well, when we don't feel good about ourselves, we do something around food. Most people overeat. There's a small population of people that starve themselves. I want to talk about the overeating today. I want to talk about this grabbing of starch, this grabbing of junk food, and what happens for us. It's an automatic way to comfort. It's an automatic way to reduce anxiety try to bring us some sleep, try to quiet, fill the void within, all because we've associated from the moment we're born, from the very, very beginning, we've associated our body, mind, and soul associates food with comfort, but it needs the kind of food that raises the chemicals, the neurochemicals that make us feel better. So sugar high starch foods or direct white sugar raises our dopamine level. And the dopamine is what, you know, dopamine is one of the happy chemicals. It's one of the mood chemicals. So there's an instant spike of about 10 minutes when we eat something sugary where we just feel better. Our anxiety is a little better. Our depression has gone just a little bit. Our insulin spikes. We have a little more energy. So we're recruiting energy when we're eating this stuff. We feel better in the moment because of the texture Remember, all of these things are a very deep, primal experience for us. They're out of our immediate awareness. And for some of us, we know. We know the texture we love. We know if it's sweet or salty. Either way, we can get that sugar, whether it's sweet or salty in our system, right? Breads, potatoes, potato chips, french fries. It's my downfall, by the way, french fries. Or direct sugar, cake, pie, candy, those types of things. So the issue is we feel better when we eat it. It feels like we're habituated. We're used to doing it. For some of us, we're on the run. You know, we're always going. And in most places, fast food or running in and grabbing something means a starch, means a bagel, means a burger, means a fry, means a bag of chips, hot dog at this, you know, gas station, whatever it may be. So for some of us, it's that. But all of these things become a habit in us. But for many, it's more than that. If we look at the obesity in civilized worlds, It's pretty amazing. 
and obesity leads to diabetes and heart disease and inflammatory process, inflammatory diseases, arthritis, joint pain, headaches, sluggishness in the morning, depression. All of these, and cancer is a big one. Cancer literally feeds off of sugar. We know these things. We know that cancer feeds off sugar. We know that sugar causes inflammation. We know that, you know, gluten rich, high starch foods are bad for us, and yet we keep doing it. And I say that we don't stop because number one, we're habituated. Number two, we're unconsciously trying to soothe and comfort, trying to fill a void. And number three, because we don't understand that, we fall into this pattern of, oh my God, I did it again. I ate that crap again. And then, of course, we feel worse about ourselves, and then we need more comfort, so then we reach more for those kinds of foods. Then we feel bad, and for many, obesity sets in. Clothes don't fit the way they used to fit. Then there's an isolation, right? Many women, even if they gain five pounds, start withdrawing. They don't feel as sexual. We don't feel as beautiful. We don't feel as sensual. We start shutting down, which increases our need for comfort increases our need for soothing, increases our need for some kind of contact because then we're missing the oxytocin. We're missing that sense of skin on skin. So it's really important to take a step back and understand this because I have found that when we don't understand it, the addiction takes over and the addiction always wins. And sugar is one of the most highly addictive processes in our world. When we have a sugar addiction, it's almost impossible to break it. And why? Because of these things that I've just mentioned. It has so many layers to it. And as difficult as it is to go into an alcohol recovery program, avoiding alcohol, for example, or avoiding cigarettes, is a little bit easier. Food is everywhere. We have to have food every single day to sustain our lives. We have to have the right nutrients. Every social event is around food. Family is around food. There's no way to avoid it. And this is the, you know, the real trick and the real trap around food. So let's talk about the dangers. Number one, it can cause cancer, can cause heart disease, can cause metabolic syndrome, diabetes type two, inflammation. So now we don't feel well. We have potential for higher risk. The older we get, higher risk for these diseases, for heart disease and cancers, arthritis, inflammatory process. I know I'm being redundant, but it's really important to get this deep into our soul. Because remember, when we're doing this work here on Are You Awake? Not necessarily just talking to your brain, talking to your soul, talking to that part of you, energetically, vibrationally, that can get it at a deeper knowing. And once again, once we fully understand, we can let ourselves off the hook. You know, we did a series on shame and blame. Oh, by the way, I have to fess up. We only did three, not four. Obviously, I can't count when I have jet lag. So last week, I talked about this as episode four. It was really three. I'll own it. Okay, sorry for the aside. Back to reality here. I have discovered over and over again that when we understand, when we have knowledge of our process, and we understand that that process is a human process, not something wrong with me, that it's the only time we can step back and have an awareness of what's happening. I had a session with somebody yesterday, and this is where this has come up at actually multiple sessions, but the first one in the morning yesterday, we were talking about, you know, first thing she says, she goes, I can't stop overeating. And we were talking about her need for comfort, you know, being a little lonely in her marriage, working really hard, having children. At the end of the day, she's exhausted, so she's, you know, shoveling food. Everyone goes to bed. She's comforting herself. She's like, I can't stop comfort eating because she had learned that it was comfort eating by then. And I just looked at her and I said, you know, Bobby, we're never going to stop comfort eating. It's not going to happen. When we try to stop the concept of comfort eating, we're already, we're in trouble. It's how we comfort eat. That's the key. For many people, loneliness really drives it. You know, habit aside, habituated process aside, we're going to get back to that in a minute. But what drove that in the first place? Anxiety is a big one. Just think of it. Those of you that have a tendency to maybe overeat, binge eat, feel a little overweight, you don't feel well, if you just really look at your diet, you're going to see it's very high starch. 
cereal, sandwiches, fast food, and then at the end of the day, more starch food. What that does is that after a while, it starts numbing us, right? The dopamine goes up, comes down, insulin goes up, comes down, up and down, up and down, and we get this numbed process. The liver gets exhausted because the liver has to process all of the sugar and it gets tired. And if the colon isn't moving it out fast enough, the gut's getting tired, and then the gut starts having a little leaky gut, it can't metabolize, can't break it down, we have acid, these foods cause acid. So we have this whole process, but that process is also very numbing. And when people are lonely or highly anxious, overeating tends to be one way to shut that down. It's also, like we said, very comforting, very soothing, because it brings us back to that first moment in time first moment we felt safety. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for that soothing. We have to discover new ways to self-soothe, but first we have to understand that we are going to comfort eat. So what if we understand that? Does it really change immediately how and what we do? For some, yeah. For some, it really does. And for others, it's like, okay, I really need comfort right now. Just think that changes everything. The knowing that Instead of, remember I talked about how I would have my head in the fridge for three days because it was comforting? I still comfort eat. And sometimes I will eat junk food. I fess up. It's okay. It's okay on the sometimes. So for those of you that are looking to, well, you look at your health and there's some obesity issues, you're overweight, any of the things that we talked about, there's cancer in your family. If you've had a cancer, you really have to look at what you're eating. And you're probably eating that way out of habit because of some form of needing comfort and to soothe and to fill time, you know, boredom. We love to eat at the movies. We love to eat in front of the television. But when we do it unconsciously, we're not going to even feel that we're full. We're not going to notice how bad our choices are. So let's say now you're aware and you step back. How does that change everything? You're like, oh, I need comfort right now. Maybe you can make a different choice, but if you can't and you walk into the kitchen to get, I don't know, bag of chips, you can say, I'm doing this because I need comfort. The moment we own that, it changes it. The power differential changes. The power leaves the food and comes back to us. Okay, I need comfort right now. I'm going to eat some of these chips. I'm going to do it guilt-free because I'm making a choice. Once the guilt is broken, once the choice is a part of the process, the cycle is broken. So we're inevitably going to do it less because we're going to have less shame. We're going to have less guilt about it. We're going to be more aware. We're going to start paying attention. Remember, the whole premise is to wake up and pay attention. So am I grabbing the Snickers bar at that 11 a.m.? Why? Well, it's quick, easy, fast. I'm used to it. It makes me feel better. Well, it makes me feel better because I have a dopamine rush. But pay attention. How long does it last? What happens 20 minutes after that Snickers bar? What happens a half an hour later? So you know me in the experiments. I believe that having information is never enough. We have the data. Let's do the experiment. What would happen if you took the one thing that you eat all the time, just the one thing, and didn't do it for a week, replaced it with something else? I don't know, yogurt, some peanut butter, fruit, replace it with something else. And each time that you crave that one thing, ask yourself, what's going on? Chances are something just happened to stress you out. Just start noting. And if this is a human phenomenon and not just a personal phenomenon, it can become a real experiment. What happens for me when I'm stressed? What happens to me when the kids are driving me crazy? What happens to me when work is an overload? What happens when I'm just exhausted? Well, usually when we're exhausted, we're trying to recruit energy. So what we want is a starch, right? So we can get that insulin rush. We can get that glycogen through the liver. We can get the dopamine rush. Okay, well, there's another way to do that. You can grab some fruit, have a little cheese with it, some goat cheese, have a little peanut butter, a little almond butter, balance it out. What would happen? What immediately happens is a sense of empowerment occurs. I'm comforting myself by choice in the way that I want to. It sounds really simple, because it is. Why is it so important? Because the Western world is loaded with the worst chronic illnesses ever. We live longer, we live sicker. 
we don't feel well. How many of you out there wake up sluggish in the morning? Many people do. And I have found that the moment people don't eat a starch before bed, eat a little protein instead, wake up without that food hangover. That's incredible. So let's try that experiment this time around. Let's do something very simple, and let's just knock it out for one whole week. And for those of you that really want to grab this, do it for, take out all starch for a week. And the question is, oh my God, what am I going to eat? How am I going to eat? What can I possibly eat? Well, there's a lot of things you can eat. There's nut butters. There's nuts. There's yogurt. There's coconut yogurt now. Coconut milk yogurt, almond milk yogurt for those of you that are dairy sensitive. Or you can have organic Greek yogurt. You can have that. You can have all kinds of veggies. And people are like, those aren't as much fun. That's true. When you have an addiction to starch and you have an addiction to the texture, those things are harder to eat. But why do we have the addiction? We have the addiction because something was missing in the first place. Now, there's some research that says people that have more of an addictive gene are more addicted to sugars. That's possible. What I have found that the quickest way to break the sugar addiction is three days no sugar. It can be grueling for some. Lots of protein, lots of meats, lots of really good fats, coconut oil, olive oil, raw butter, and vegetables. Not even fruit for three days. By the fourth day, something switch. A switch turns off in the brain. And that physical craving is gone. So what if you asked yourself, let me do this three-day sugar detox. And then I'm going to take a look at what drives my actions. It's not that hard. It doesn't take time. It just takes desire. It takes desire to pull ourselves out of this cycle that causes so much illness, that causes us to just not feel well. Do you get irritable midday? Are you just overloaded and overwhelmed and exhausted? Take a look at what you're eating. Also take a look at what's happening. What are you feeling? Is life just hard? I mean, I don't know how many people walk around saying, I hate my life. And some people don't. Some people love their lives and still, you know, eat a bunch of junk and say, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then one day we're not. The knees hurt. The elbows hurt. Yesterday was the day around food, I think, which is why we're doing this podcast today. I had a young man in who's one of those people that loves to grab knowledge, learns and learns and learns and applies it. Because many people are really into their health and will do whatever it takes to stay healthy and well. And he's one of these people. He was talking about specific podcasts around health and what he learned about brain chemistry and how he's added more minerals to his diet and how he feels better. And I talked to him about why I do my podcast the way I do. And he's like, that makes a bunch of sense to me. Because for him... The way that he manages his anxiety is to take care of his health. So many of my listeners are those people as well. So if you're one of the people that are really good about managing your health, let's take a look. Do you get really obsessive about it? What's that about? And that's fine. You know, I'd much rather we spend our energy in being well than not being well. But this is an opportunity for you to pat yourself on the back and say, okay, well, what do I do? When I'm stressed, do I have any negative behaviors? And if I don't, this is wonderful. Then how can I bring this forward in the world without being preachy? You know, nobody likes holier than thou. But really take a look. And if you're one of those people, feel good. Feel really good that somewhere along the line you figured it out and that you made your health and wellness a priority and you're a minority. More and more people are attempting that and younger people are attempting that. But understand, when you have a sugar addiction and it's instantly addictive for the reasons mentioned, trans fats, fructose, these things will kill you. They will hurt you. They will cause unbelievable distress in your day. And I can't tell you how many people fight me on this. But what I ask these people, especially the ones that fight me in my office, let's just do it for a week, two weeks at best, three-day sugar detox, only proteins, really good fats, vegetables, unrefined salt for the minerals. Celtic sea salt, Redmond salt, unrefined. Eat the unrefined salt and it's really good for you. And you can read Dr. David Brownstein's book on salt. Very quick read, very easy read. You can look that up. He's amazing, my mentor. 
but you can look that up. Unrefined salt, really good fats, protein, vegetables. Do it for three days, then do it for a week. Just monitor. What happens? What's the self-talk? Are you angry with yourself? Are you excited? Are you proud? How do you feel? How do you wake up in the morning? The first thing you're going to notice is how you wake up in the morning. That's key. And is that going to be reinforcing enough to make some of these changes permanent? So let's stop here for today. Let's really take a look at sugar. And remember, sugar comes in all starches, bread, potato, rice, pasta, all junk food. Junk food has trans fats in it. It has fructose, corn, all of these things that the body can't break down. It goes into all kinds of inflammation. Another woman came into my office. I hadn't seen her in a month. Her hands were swollen. Her hands hurt. Her joints hurt. I looked at her, and she was, had just moved. I'm like, no, you've been eating starch. She's like, oh my God, I have. Instantly, when we clean it out, we start to see the difference. And remember, this is a human phenomenon. Why? Because in the very beginning, our safety, comfort, and soothing came from contact, safety, and food. So we don't want to take that away from us. We want to awaken to it. We want to bring our consciousness to it so that we can prevent serious disease. Most importantly, we can bring joy, health, and bliss into our lives. Because when we feel good, we laugh more. When we laugh more, we have more endorphins. When we have more endorphins, people like to be around us. We find more things to do. We're more active. Even if our life feels impossible, we let go of that want, want, negative self-talk when we feel better. Just pay attention. The more tired we are, the more negative we are. We're going to be more tired when we're on this roller coaster of sugar. So let's do this experiment one week. We'll come back. We'll take this further next time. So let's take a few moments. Let's do today's exercise. As always, thank you for hanging out with me. Check out social media, Facebook, Twitter, Are You Awake? Dr. Goodall, areyouawakeshow.com. And please, all comments, Dr. Goodall, connect at drgoodall.com. I look forward to hearing from you. Take a breath. Sigh it out. And the first thing you want to ask yourself is, what does it feel like to wake up feeling good? Put yourself in your bed. Just put yourself in your bed. The alarm's gone off. And first imagine what it feels like now. What's your morning like? Now shift that to your eyes open right up when the alarm goes off. You're not achy breaky. You don't think about the whole day in front of you. You just think about in this moment, what does it feel like to feel good in the morning? Nothing else. Not the whole day. It's overwhelming. Just the moment. Okay. Now breathe that experience in. Move your fingers and your toes. You feel good. Your body doesn't hurt. You're wide awake. The alarm just went off. You're wide awake. Take a deep breath. And as you exhale, you're like, oh, wow. This is amazing. I can feel the light in me. I can feel how alert I am. I can feel that I like me. This moment's mine. I don't have to get out just yet. I can stretch in my bed. This moment's all mine. Stretch your arms out. Take another deep breath. Just feel how it feels to just like me for a moment. Say the words, I like this. I like the way this feels. do anything for one week. I can be in charge of my health. Most importantly, I can be in charge of my awakening. I have everything I need. And this feels remarkable. And just hang out in your stretch. Take some deep breaths. Let the music soothe you. As you smile into your body, smile into your soul, 
smile into your day.